Hello, my wonderful spirit guides. I have already tried starting this video and I got like five minutes in and I was tripping over my words so bad. And I was like, so I just needed a fresh start and I've started again because I was like, <laughs> I don't even know why. It was so silly. Maybe it's because I'm all hot in here now. I don't know, that'll be a bit dramatic. Can't speak because I'm a little bit sweaty. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, I'm reacting to Nine Inch Nails, The Downward Spiral. And I am literally so looking forward to this. It's actually been highly anticipated. And I know that a lot of viewers on Spirit Guide, should I say, on YouTube have wanted to see this too, as well as the patrons. And it was actually requested by a patron called Cass in the Grass, who is absolutely wonderful. And yeah, they've also given me like a little sort of document that like helps with the songs and like the concepts and so on. You know, just like a little, uh, bit of info about the songs and the album. I'll read the start. Hi, thanks for listening. This is a concept album that tells the story of a man's descent into madness as he loses faith in humanity and himself. Though it tells a fictional story, it is also very personal to Trent Reznor. He wrote all the lyrics, played many of the instruments and was heavily involved in arrangement and production. So these songs also reference Trent's very weird experience with drugs and mental illness. The following explanations represent the most commonly accepted ones, but he left most songs open to interpretation. Oh, that's brilliant. I love like a, a, a loose kind of meaning, but then you can figure it out in your own way or, or whatever it feels to you. I, lo I love stuff like that, but that's amazing. I'm so excited. I know one song and that is Hurt. And, and that became very famous, wasn't it? A very famous song. And I think Johnny Cash covered it actually. If you would like to see this video entirely uncut, which means no uh, edits and chops in the audio, then pop over to my Patreon. You can join at the lowest tier to watch it like that. And there are many other tiers as well that you can pick from uh, if you want to make song requests, album requests, and so on like that. I also have a tip jar if you just want to send me a little tip. Like I've said before, my videos don't really get monetized due to copyright and so on. Very frustrating as it is fair use as I do talk about the music, review the music and give educational feedback where and when I can. Um, so it's annoying but it's just the YouTube bots and it's what they do but anyway if you would like to support me that would be absolutely amazing absolutely no pressure at the same time though um you can also follow me on instagram and that is completely free i shall follow you back too also you can like comment and subscribe if you like my video and i also have a discord so you can hop over there and talk to like-minded people about music or whatever you desire but yeah i actually got that out really good then i can't tell you how Freaking hard that was a minute ago. I think I just got into like, do it, do it mode. And I just said it and that was quite good. I think I did all right. <laughs> anyway, let's get bloody well on into it. Oh, right, let me get the lyrics up as well, actually. So the album came out in March, 1994, which is literally just a year before I was born. Um, hmm. I hope I wasn't conceived to any of these songs. <laughs> Who knows? Well, I don't know. If I hear a really cool song, maybe I, I do hope so. It would explain a lot of things. All the demons inside of me. <laughs> I actually said to my mum, I was reacting to Nine Inch Nails, wondering if she knew who they were. And she was like, oh yeah, I actually saw them. And they supported um, Guns N' Roses. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And she was like, she thought it was in 94, but it was actually in 91. I looked it up and uh, it was Skid Row uh, supported Guns N' Roses as well. And I was like, oh God, that sounds like a very good fun time. Very good fun time. <laughs> but no, uh, I had to add that in the video because I just thought that was pretty cool. Cass had said about the first song, which is called Mr. Self-Destruct, our introduction to the evil side of the protagonist his evil side is called Mr. Self-Destruct slash The Ruiner, which will take over the protagonist as the album progresses. This song seems to be mostly sung from the perspective of Mr. Self-Destruct. The protagonist has begun his downward spiral into madness and starts feeling like he has no control over his life. Mr. Self-Destruct Struck seems to mock the listener slash protagonist, stating, you let me do this to you, reminding us that we are all potentially destructive. We all have a potentially destructive side. Absolutely, we we do. Not potentially, we do. We all have a dark side and light side. That's the balance of life. 
you know that's a balance of everything um so yeah but i do i understand this too and the destructive part can comes out in times of heartbreak i'd say yeah heartbreak is often brought out a destructive side um of course drugs um grief any type of pain yeah can bring out a dark side a destructive side in you but anyway i haven't even heard the song yet so let's get into it um i did this yesterday with a video but i'm gonna put my sunglasses on just for a little bit because it helps neutralize my eyes against the light that are burning my balls um <laughs> i get really sensitive to light i should show you my makeup as well it's just kind of red and maroon it, do you know what? it didn't start like this it kind of went oh it's gone all it's done something. It's done something wrong that it's not meant to do. I've sorted it, I think. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't even meant to be like this. It just ended up being like this. It was quite different before it started. And now it's turned into some sort of... I don't know what you want to call it, really, but it's red. <laughs> right, anyway, let's do this. That's better. Okay, Mr. Self-Destruct, hit it. <laughs> Oh god, how corny. Hit it, DJ! Mm. He's been beaten. Holy shit. Sampling it into like a drum beat. Oh, I love that. Easy to sing along to, actually. Yeah. It's actually very trebly. That is amazing. That's got such a 90s feeling. And it, you know, of course it was made in the 90s. Oh, just how quiet that vocal is. Ooh, spooky. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. That's cool. Destruction has taken over. Fuck. Whoa. That weirdly reminds me of like rewinding a videotape. Very disturbing and uncomfortable. Wow. Oh, okay, before we go into that, wow, yeah, you can definitely hear how. Nine Inch Nails influenced people today, such as, well, Poppy, for one, for her, her Flux album, an E album, have that very bit crushery, trebly sound with the like thrashy, you know, like, shh, uh, to the music, um, that grit, so to speak. Um, yeah. Wow, that was cool. And actually really easy to sing along to, really easy to pick up the words and just go for it. Um, yeah, and I could feel like the story to it. I could feel the self-destruction in it. He even says, I missed the self-destruct in the song, you know? Um, cool, yeah, not much else to say other than that. I just thought it was really good. That bit at the end freaked me out. And I do remember Cass saying something about it being, some of it being recorded in the home where Sharon Tate lived. Um, and some people were upset by that. 
which is completely understandable. I think he even apologised for it, though. But I could definitely, with that bit at the end, it almost gave me a demonic feeling, some sort of heavy darkness. And you can only imagine the thoughts you'd be having and staying in a place like that and recording in a place like that where such a tragedy happened with uh, Charles Manson and so on. But wow, uh, <sighs> twisted. I'll read what it says here. It doesn't seem to have anything really that stands out. I might click some of the lyrics and see if anything's said. I don't know, I think it just, go, the words are what they are. You know, I am the voice inside your head and I control you. I am the lover in your bed and I control you. I am the sex that you provide and I control you. I am the hate you tried to hide, but I control you. You know, it's just all about this dark side controlling every move of, of Trent and so on. So, and then I take you where you want to go. I give you all you need to know. I drag you down. I use you up, Mr. Self-Destruct. But it's like, I take you where you want to go. It's like, where you want to go is interesting because it's like, you will get to the top. You will get to where you want to go. And it you won't be kind about it because in a destructive way, you're not really kind. It's, you know, it's like you will walk over people to get to where you want to go. And this destructive side is literally being like, I will get you where you want to go. It doesn't matter who you stand on to get there, but I'll get you there. So there's something, you know, a bit poisonous about it. And then I drag you down, I use you up as well, you know, like I can bring you down to the ground and I can use you up. I can use everything that's in you to my advantage. And then in the bridge, you let me do this to you. You let me. It's like, you know, it's not like you're stopping me, is it? Nah, you let me. You literally let me control you like that. And then it says, I am an exit in brackets. I wonder what that means. I am an exit, like some sort of release. I am a release, you know, I'm a release of all the pain you feel inside. Um, I'll have a look. I've, I've clicked on it here. Since Mr. Self-Destruct is found in every human on Earth, he is speaking to all of us by saying that even though we tried to hide all the terrible things that Mr. Self-Destruct does for us, he is still in control of us all, leading the realisation that, along with the continuing story of the album, we let him take us, take us over. The whispered delivery of the line especially feels like a small voice in the back of your head that you try to ignore, but becomes more powerful the more you think about it. Oh, absolutely. Desire, impulse, all those things. But yeah, I am an exit. I wonder if that does mean like I am the release. I am the excuse that you can use. Oh, I'm in self-destruct mode. Uh, and then obviously it goes on to I am the needle in the vein. I am the high you can't sustain, which is, it just makes a lot of sense. It's very like uh, about drugs and so on. Like I am that demon, the, the demon, that, the devil on your shoulder that comes with drugs and like the high you can't sustain because you can't, you know, after the first one or the second one or third one, you, you're high will deplete more and more and more and you'll have to use more to even get to <laughs> any level of what you'd want your high to be like. But yeah, anyway, I do want to move on because I've got to get through the whole thing. But yeah, this next song is called Piggy. Yeah, you. Oh, I love that moody sound. Hey, pig, piggy, pig, pig, pig. Nice. Interesting. There's been a little bit of Radiohead here. They can't stop me now, cause I don't care anymore. Nothing can stop me now, cause I don't care. Nothing can stop me now. Oh, I love how simple that is, but so intense. Oh, the organ. Oh my god, it's so beautiful. It's got those 90s melodies and, you know, feelings that I just love so much. A bit of stoner rock feel. Mmm, it's a little bit massive attack too. Oh yeah, fuck yeah. Oh, the way that sounds. It. 
Oh, it's so filthy. Love all the industrial sounds. Drums, bass, and just some interesting industrial sounds. Oh, fucking fantastic. Oh, the drums. <laughs> Pioneers. Vibrato tremolo situation. I love that. Oh, that's nice. Fuck. This is actually really experimental for like a 90s kind of rock sound. It's experimental. Wow. What would they call their genre? Because it's got, to me, it's got like an industrial. Oh, actually, kind of weirdly went into that then not, i don't know if it did but it ended and oh whatever but yeah i wonder what they call their genre just because it has it's industrial rock really with a bit of like you know the trip hoppy element but then it's also got experimental sounds which can often follows the industrial sound so let me have a look it's like rock google says rock it's just rock all right <laughs> It's definitely not just rock. Yeah, pretty much most of it's saying industrial rock band. Yeah, it's the main thing, industrial rock. Electro-industrial alternative rock. Yeah, and like, do you know what I mean by that 90 sound? It hurt, I, I wish I could explain it better, but that 90 sound, uh, I think like the Deftones had it a little bit, or when you think of um, Black Hole Sun, won't you come? <laughs> you know, like, just like that kind of, uh, oh, and Queens of the Stone Age too, very like, um, it's like a moody sound, and Radiohead too. Yeah, like it's like moody, dark, sound that has these certain notes that are chosen with the vocal and so on it's really nostalgic to me and i i just call it the 90s sound and then in pop music the 90s sound is like this kind of ethereal freedom sounds i call them but when it comes to rock it's like this moody sound but yeah love it so much um also i didn't read what was written by Cass. I'm gonna read that. Piggy, the protagonist, is now narrating. The protagonist's loved one, called Piggy, probably a girlfriend or close friend, has left him. As you get halfway through the song, two minutes 50, you hear Trent Reznor going crazy on the drums. The drums are thought to represent the chaos of the downward spiral. This is also the first of many times you'll hear the downward spiral uh, motif, lay motif. Um, Okay, cool. With regards to the chorus, Trent Reznor said, I'm saying if I don't care, you can't affect me. You'll hear the line, nothing can stop me now, multiple times throughout the album. The song name is likely a reference to an old bandmate who left Nine Inch Nails, nicknamed Piggy, Richard Patrick from the band Filter. The two have since made up though. Oh, that's very interesting. Piggy. Imagine that as your nickname. All right, Piggy. <laughs> Oh, it looks like that's true as well, looking on here as well. Richard Patrick from the band Filter was a guitarist in Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. Cool. Fun facts. It is one of many songs to include the phrase, nothing can stop me now. The drum solo featured in the last half of the song is actually performed by Trent Reznor himself. Not so fun fact. Like the rest of the album and Broken, Piggy was written at 150 CDO Drive. Yeah, that's what I was saying. The site Sharon Tate's murder by the Manson family in 1969. Yeah. The house was converted into a record studio that Reznor called Le Pig, referencing when Susan Atkins wrote pig in Tate's blood on the front door of the house. The word pig itself referenced the Beatles song Piggies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dark interesting we are fascinated with things like that though aren't we all of us we're fascinated with murders like that they almost don't feel real you know uh you know it's real but it doesn't always feel real um because it's not something that you just see every day dark stuff like that so i can understand the mindset all right anyway next song it's called here here's he here's a here's 
Heresy. Heresy, I think. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Um, Cass has said, Heres Hearsay, is, mm, is it Hearsay? Expresses Trent Reznor, the protagonist's frustration with modern religion. This delusionment likely makes the spiral worse. Trent has said about this song, I was trying to explore some of the paranoia I have as, se as a sexually active person in the age of AIDS. He says, I guess I feel cheated for not growing up in a more liberated era. At the same time, what gets me mad is the way the right wing has used the convenience of this epidemic and helping to promote their own agenda. You're damn right about that. Absolutely. Saying basically AIDS is only for the gays, but absolutely not. Um, mm. Anyway, yeah, let's hear it. This one's got some bulk. Yeah. The high vocal? Industrial sound. Mmm, so much tension. Can you feel that tension rising? Oh, yeah. for that but wow yeah that's a real head banger that's a, like you know like a body banger <laughs> body banger but you know just a real ferocious ugh. just get into that one go fucking mad on it you know bit of like a rage against the machine feeling when you do fuck you won't do what you tell me you know that kind of aggression that real oh you can't stop moving you can't help but just move and go mad to it that's definitely what that had i'm taking these off for a sec you turn my heating down I feel like a bloody boiled potato. Look like one too. <sighs> Look all tall now. I'll lift it up a little bit. Just sat on, sat a little differently for a second because I don't know what it is. I need like a memory foam pillow or something just because my coccyx always hurts when I sit down on anything unless it's like really soft. I don't know why because I've got a rather large arse to be honest. I need to be cosy and not knock over this candle. <laughs> this is not working. Ah! Oh! <laughs> I was nearly a downward spiral myself then. Nearly on the floor. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. I, I did a little bit, but I shortened it and it didn't really make much sense um, because I was faffing around so much. But I did want to say that um, it's funny that um, this album's called Downward Spiral because Charles Manson uh, basically blamed the murders on that song Helter Skelter by The Beatles. And Helter Skelter, well, what is that? It's a downward spiral, isn't it? Uh, a slide that goes down in a spiral. So, yeah, I thought that was interesting. I know it seems really obvious, but I like that I pieced that one together. Enough said, really. Downward spiral, Helter Skelter, they do the exact same thing. I thought that was interesting. Right. Well, that was absolutely crazy, that song. 
I love that. God is dead and no one cares. All right. No one bloody well cares. So shut it. Um, and again, talking about swines as well. He made a virus that would kill off all the swine. Can't Basically, it says here, he can't believe in a God who permits a world full of suffering and can't tolerate what atrocities are done in his name. The virus is likely a reference to the AIDS virus and a belief by some extreme conservatives that AIDS was created by God to combat homosexuality. Which is kind of what I said earlier uh, in uh, reply to what Trent had already said, but yeah, dark times, dark fucking times. Anyway, um, moving on, let's go to March of the Pigs, back to the old pigs again. Loves pigs, this one. God is dead. Yeah, had a punky feel as well, which I loved. All right, Cass has said, March of the Pigs seems to criticize fake people, consumerist culture and fan culture. Fans essentially enjoy and benefit from the protagonist, Trent Reznor's pain. He gives them what they want, his art, music, pain, life, and they endlessly take from him. And then it says here, this is the fastest Nine Inch Nails song at 269 BPM. Well, let's see how it goes. Interesting as well, like, you know, the fans are, you know, taking from him, taking his pain, like, but actually it's more about relatability. I think he might... I, I'm not saying that fans can't feel like vultures sometimes, leeching onto you, little, you know, vampires. Um, not in my case, I, you know. All, all the fans I've met have been fucking wonderful. But I understand what that, I understand what is being said, but yeah, that's difficult. But, I, you know, if you're going to put out music that is dark and painful, um, mainly people are just going to relate to it. Uh, you know, it's because they relate, not because they're like, it's not like watching a soap opera where you just want to see people's pain. But maybe some, for some it is. Maybe for some it is. Oh, yeah, I can't say it isn't. But anyway, I'm interested to hear this super fast song. March of the Pigs. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. It almost feels like it's sampled and played again and again. Like looped. Maybe it is. It sounds like a loop. into this again tension and release right there that like you know to this ooh, cruising I love that that's cool yeah Love that contrast. Oh, that was a pretty short song as well, as well as a fast one. Doesn't it make you feel better? I love that. That's so funny and it like kind of happy, uh, almost like he's on a stage, like, doesn't it make you feel better? You know, uh, it, it's like that sarcasm, that kind of like, oh, at least you feel good. At least you feel so much better now that I've got on all my pain out and you could go, oh, well, I feel much more cozy about my life because my life doesn't suck that bad. You know, it's like that sort of situation. I'm guessing. Lyrically, the song represents all of the fake people encountered in the protagonist's life and his desire to peel back the mask they wear. The song itself is critical of society and the apparent superficiality of life. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, great song again. Doesn't it make you feel better? <laughs> and then the chaos comes back in like, it's like, 
that is just pure literal chaos and pain and aggression and you know emotion and please greed feed you know all this like kind of consuming <laughs> Right, anyway, let's do it. Let's move on to the next one. Next one is called Closer. Cass has said, Closer, I suspect you heard this one. The song is actually about self-hatred and obsession. The protagonist finds himself disgusting like an animal and feels like he is, like he contaminates his partner by having sex with them. Sex is an attempt to feel a void and the way that the protagonist attempts to feel less lonely. You bring me closer to God has two possible interpretations, either closer to God in a pleasure sense or closer to God as in closer to death. Reznor felt that the song was widely, widely misinterpreted. He has said it's super negative and super hateful. It's a, uh, I'm a piece of shit and I am declaring that. And if you think you want me, here I am. I didn't think it would become a frat party anthem or a titty dance around them <laughs> oh shit okay i have no idea what this is going to sound like then um but that's incredibly sad that's inc and, and you know funnily enough black dresses said something similar they had a song about tra something traumatic and it became a tiktok sound so they wrote a song about how it wasn't meant to be you know it was almost hurtful to see it as this like edgy TikTok sound when it was a real trauma that they were expressing and it was a little bit difficult. So yeah, that that's interesting. Um, gosh, I'm really curious about this now. Um, but yeah, the, the meanings are incredibly sad. Oof, that amount of self-hate and disgust in yourself certainly comes from something, whether it be toxic masculinity or abuse itself, you know? Uh, Maybe he had something happen to him that made him feel that way or just he's seen men act a certain way or I don't know, but it's definitely a horrible way to feel about yourself. Anyway, let's go for it. And I'm interested. Oh, it's certainly got a lot of listens. 187 million. So this was a popular one. Is it getting faster, the tempo? You let me violate you. Oh, I love those sounds. You let me penetrate you. You let me complicate you. Help me. I broke apart my insides. Oh, this is familiar. I've got no soul to say. It's definitely familiar. Help me get away from myself. I wanna fuck you like you never know. Of course, I know this. I know it from Limp Bizkit. My whole existence is flawed. You get me closer to God. I, uh, they must have done a cover. Yeah, I think they changed some of the lyrics though on the Limp Bizkit one. You can't have my you can't have the hate that it mm, I really like that. That sounds so nice. Help me. Help me. Ooh. It's very Gary Newman, actually, this. What a raw song, though. Oh. Oh, yeah. It's cool. Really lets you sit with it. I love how it's evolving as well. Oh. You can feel it. 
flittering from ear to ear. Wow. It's like it's whooshing through your skull. Ooh, then it went into Ruiner. Very cool, yeah. Uh, dark song um, content. But yeah, no, the sound of it really has like a, it reminded me of Gary Newman mixed with the knife. You know, it had like a gothic kind of electronica feeling to it. And it did have like a nice groove to it. But of course, the lyrical content was just dark, isn't it? Literally, you let me violate you. You let me desecrate you. You let me penetrate you. You let me complicate you. It's almost like he feels like he doesn't deserve pleasure um, in the form of another person because he feels like all he does is damage people. All he does is hurt people. So why would he deserve to feel pleasure from someone? Um, it's almost like this kind of, he feels selfish for it. Such a self-loathing. And the whole like, I want to F you like an animal. You know, I feel like it's got a lot of meaning to it, you know, and I want to feel you from the inside. It actually feels more meaningful than just like how gritty and raw it sounds. You know, I want to F you like an animal, you know, that can sound very detached. Um, and because he has so much emotion around sex and so on, maybe to just to do it like an animal, he would he would be able to be able to detach from the emotion and not you know, and to detach from the emotion, he doesn't have to feel all that self-loathing and self-doubt and insecurity and low self-esteem within it. Um, you know, it, it'd be more of like a organic thing, something that he doesn't have to think or feel in. Obviously, that's not the greatest, that's not really what you'd want. That's the very opposite. What you'd really want is to feel happy and to feel good about himself. But sometimes you know how, when we're in a bad place, we say, I just wanna die. I don't wanna be here anymore. I can't do this anymore. But instead, what you really mean is, I don't wanna feel like this and I want to be happy. I wish I could be happy. I wish I could feel good again. I, I wanna feel better. Uh, you know, that's the real feeling, you know. And then I wanna feel you from the inside. Of course, that can, that has a sexual, you know, nuance to it, but at the same time, I want to feel you from the inside. I want to feel who you are. I want to be in your soul. I want to, uh, you know, be there with you. Um, but instead, I have all this horrible anguish and self loathing that gets in the way of that. Maybe, you know, and then you get me closer to God again, like Cass said, maybe that means closer to death, or it could mean like, you know, closer to what, uh, what did Cass say? Close to God in a pleasure sense or close to God in a death sense. Yeah, it's all, uh, you know, merged together. It's actually really clever songwriting and very, like, shocking songwriting, which is cool because sometimes things just need to be said and understood and they need to be uh, heard in a way that is like, oh, because he's coming from a place of feeling disgusted with himself. He wants you to feel disgusted with him too so you know exactly what he's trying to portray. Brilliant. All right, next song is called Ruiner. Oh, weird. It's like a wind sound, but like sped up. Like wind for a chimney where it whistles. Oh, that's out. 
absolutely dirty. The panning is so interesting too. Wow, it just feels wrong. But I love it. Then it comes, just all like full and back in the middle, you know? Mono. Can't stop me now, like in a song previous. Mm, building. I had a feeling that would happen. I, I had this feeling because it was like this, you know, repetitive, nothing can stop me now, but it felt like it was building in a weird way. But I was like, I bet it will literally amount to nothing. I bet it will just cut short. And it did exactly that. Interesting. Um, yeah, so Cass did actually say, I didn't read it beforehand. I do apologize. But um, the Ruiner trigger warning mentions R. Uh, R word briefly. The protagonist realizes that the ruiner is getting too strong to contain. The chorus is probably meant to be a double entendre as the protagonist views the ruiner as a dominating male taking over his life. The guitar solo at 2.45 represents the ruiner and the protagonist fighting for control. That makes sense with the panning because it's like too, it felt very separated, which I found interesting. After the solo, the protagonist tries to convince himself that the ruiner won't win, repeating the mantra, you didn't hurt me, nothing can hurt me, you didn't hurt me, nothing can stop me now. And actually, in a way, that makes sense because it became mono, where it all felt very much in the centre again. And it felt like he was gluing himself back together and being like, nah, fuck you, this, I'm going to, you know, fight this thing, in a way. Um, interesting i do want to click on the double on chandra bit though and see what someone else has said as well it seems to say here one of many sexually charged slash confused metaphors imagined by the protagonist he thinks of the ruiner as a dominating male who is controlling his life yes like Cass said actually um these lines might also mean that the main character's other ego, Mr. Self-Destruct, has always been with him, but in these latest moments, he has become much stronger and more than just a voice in his head and will now take full control of the main character. Interesting, but however, towards the end, with the, you can't hurt me now, you didn't hurt me, you can't stop me now, but in a way, thinking about it, that could be the ruiner saying those things as well. Uh, uh, Mr. Self-Destruct saying you can't hurt me, anything you try and do, you can't stop me. It could be that as well, but maybe, I'd like to think it's the protagonist though. The guitar solo bit was really dirty, you know what I mean? Like it just felt wrong, it felt wrong. And, and I that was before I even read what Cass had said. I saw the trigger warning, but I didn't read the rest. Brilliant. Another brilliant fucking song. <laughs> They're also like, they really do have a great, like, uh, they fit well into this concept. They've really gelled together. It's a brilliant album in that way as well. Fucking hell. This is awesome. And, you know, I feel like I'm doing, my, sorry, I'm not, <laughs> I'm just trying to sort my pillow out. Yeah, I feel like listening to this as well is like such a, something I should have done a long time ago because it is so, like like I said earlier, they're like pioneers for so much music to come and so on. They, they really uh, done something, you know, they were the foundation for a lot of industrial rock and as well as just rock rock. But yeah, you know, I can, I can hear a lot of Marilyn Manson in it. I can hear a lot of the killers, um, not the killers, uh, sorry, the vines in it. Um, uh, even Muse in there. There's so much and I can't think of them all right now, but I can hear, there's little parts I keep hearing and being like, wow, that, that you can see that where the, the influences were, but I'm also wondering what, the, you know, thinking of what they were influenced by as well. So I don't know, I just love it. It's really cool, really cool and different. And it's cool that it did like this industrial kind of sound because it is a little bit different to what everyone else does. And it became very popular in a more of a niche genre, which is just fucking phenomenal. All right, next song is called The Becoming. I'm just over an hour into filming. I might have a little break in a minute just because 
I'm sorry, but my coccyx is just not it. What do I do? How do I make it not hurt? <laughs> like everything else about me is fine, but my arse, <laughs> my arse bone. <laughs> oh, all right, let's see. I think I've done something where it feels a bit better. <laughs> all right, the becoming. Oh, I'll read what Cassie said quickly, actually. Cass in the grass, Cass in the grass. Okay, it's funny because I say grass, grass, like grass, but I can't go Cass in the grass, so I have to be like Cass in the grass. I have to actually change the way I say grass. Anyway. <laughs> okay, the becoming, warning that things are about to get much darker slash heavier. This is a good halfway point if you want to take a break. <laughs> How weird, I literally just said that about taking a break. Or well, maybe, yeah, I'll do it just before I start this one. Or I listen to this one and then... Nah, I think it's good. Mm. Okay, right, I'll just read this. The Runa is starting to take over the protagonist. The protagonist becomes mechanical as he loses feelings. It's my personal theory that the gross, plucky, mechanical sounds as well as the increased use of electronic slash non-instrumental sounds, are meant to represent the ruiner, which is also synthetic and non-human. You hear these sounds a lot throughout the rest of the album. Oh, I like the thought of that. That's cool. All right, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll listen to this one and then I'll take my break after. Um, but I'm ready. Mmm, mmm. Yeah, they are interesting sounds. Very horror. Almost sounds like people screaming in like fear. Sorry, Cass has got me sparking some thoughts now. Now I'm hearing like the instrumental parts as like the ruiner. Uh, doc, uh, doctor, I keep nearly saying Doctor Feelgood from fucking Motley Crue song. <laughs> but I mean, Mr. Self Destruct. Yeah. And so like the ruiner is like the ding, 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 ding. And then like all the other sounds, I'm like screaming or people are like ah, in terror and it feels like the music's almost stomping over these people like a big Godzilla or something walking through the city. <laughs> Got me sparking these images now. Yeah, funnily enough, um, in uni I created a production piece for a kind of film, like a moving image, random thing. We all got loads of different ones to choose from and I chose this one because it just called to me for some reason um obviously i'm just showing you a little bit of it and it's cut up um into two segments so um this, the whole thing is on instagram if you want to scroll through and look for it um and it has a description for what it all means as well but it weirdly reminded me of this song the nine inch nails song which is funny because i've never even heard this nine inch nails song i was just trying to make something kind of weird and horror I, I don't know, the, uh, it's hard to explain, <laughs> it's hard to explain, but you should check out the whole video on Instagram, because, um, I don't know, I was really proud of it for it being my first production piece, but, yeah, hopefully you see what I mean when you hear it. takes a part of me something takes a part of me is that corn hang on so hang on something takes a part of me frequent unleashed by corn it gave me a little bit of that again see more influences there 
Because <laughs> this, um, and, and it's all very 90s again. And this came out before that song by Korn came out. You go, oh, God, the influences are crazy. But um, sorry, I'll go back a bit. of the acoustic guitar it actually really breaks up the, the intense crazy sounds <laughs> that sounds so scary and demonic you can really feel him fighting this thing but the thing's taking over but there's still a little bit of i'm oh, 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 oh yeah it reminds me of uh dissociation moving into the next song like this very glitchy yeah very cool um yeah it, it gives me uh thoughts of dissociation and believe it or not when i was uh uh 18 years old so, yeah 17 well actually 16 17 18 i had a lot of problems with dissociative um situations i don't want to talk about it like too heavily of course not not right now um but you know I almost, I built another character, which is a little bit like Mr. Self-Destruct, actually. And um, this character's popped out before, uh, after, and, you know, many times in my life. But anyway, under circumstances, uh, this character has become very prominent. And I've even written a poem about uh, something a little bit different, which is uh, depersonalization very different well it's not very different it's still an associative sort of category but different because you're not <laughs> long-winded but um yeah i wrote a poem about um with the de depersonalization and what i wrote with it was in um when you dissociate from like a trigger or something you can often feel like you're sat in a passenger seat and there's another version of you driving the car and there's not much you can do but just like sit there and wait for it to be over um and we do, with depersonalization that person driving a car is very cold and doesn't talk very just like a mannequin almost but when i had dis some dissociation when i was younger i made up a full character full character like a full woman <laughs> yeah and um it was really good for a time. It really helped me out. But obviously, I, it, it, um, I got therapy and so on like that in it and got better. Uh, but I found I missed the character for a long time just because she was a big protector of my inner child. However, she was cruel 
and um I would have like feelings of like grandeur and like feeling when this destructive thing takes over and like like you know Trent has said we all have it a destructive part of us and when it takes over obviously your humanity and a good part of you doesn't want it to right you you want to be like you but there is a part that um of it where you do you do want it to happen because you just don't want to care anymore you want someone else to take the wheel and yeah you kind of succumb to it then you come back round and then you know well in my case I came back round and was like no no I can't let this be me I because it's actually kind of upsetting. It's all like a defense. It's all a defense mechanism. At the end of the day, it's hard to explain without going into full detail. And this isn't that type of video, but I just really heard what he was saying in this song, and it felt like a little bit close to home in like a a beautiful way. But I just felt it on like a very very personal level, and that kind of the me you want to know knew isn't going to be here anymore. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. Ah. Oh. Yeah, it definitely got darker, didn't it? Um... I just wanted to make a little bit more sense of all that. Um, basically, uh, the ages 16 to 18, I, um, through trauma, um, I kind of switched into a character that uh, was obviously another version of me, but it sound, that is a little bit like Mr. Self-Destruct, and we all have it in us, um, like Trent said. But... Um, she was I think I do actually talk a bit more about it later in the video actually so I won't I won't describe too much but um yeah that was the sort of dissociative identity thing of course I know D DID is a um a long term sort of illness that can be treated but can't be cured and so on like that um I had a brief stunt with it so I can't really say I've got the idea and I, and I won't say I've got the idea I don't have the idea but I definitely had an interesting moment and it could really just have been some sort of psychosis just a coping mechanism I've had many strange coping mechanisms in my life trust me very many and I think it just comes from having a very creative mind I manage my way through things through creativity I guess um I'm resourceful so <laughs> Yeah, I got through that with a lot of therapy and it really did take a lot of therapy, but it really helped. And also, I just want to say depersonalization and derealization are also part of a dissociative, the, 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 the dissociative category. Um, and I suffer with both those things to this day. However, they're usually only when I get triggered or and so on like that and I haven't had a moment like that in a quite a long time which is a really good as well I'm really happy about that but yeah that's um a bit different because you don't become another character but you watch yourself as if you are a character and you, the character you play is just empty and numb and that's what I meant by like you're the passenger in a car and you're watching yourself drive the car, but with a numb expression, just very plain. Um, yeah, I'll put the poem in the description um, if you want to read it, because actually it might help you a lot. It's quite detailed and explains depersonalization thoroughly. Um, yeah. I know that a lot of it's to do with uh, a drug situation too yeah the disease of addiction and all that it brings wants him dead his brain has been rewired to crave drugs even if he doesn't want to use this voice might also be that of his depression yeah exactly it's all the same in some ways obviously the drug one's different because there are physical uh, symptoms to that as well and uh, the drug demon <laughs> drug demon um is is different because it doesn't really sound like this big loud voice at first. It's almost like, you know, the devil. The devil is meant to be beautiful. Has a voice like an angel. Looks like an angel. You know, he is a fallen angel after all. Um, and that's what the, to me, that's what the addiction voice sounds like. When I was taking my pills, it was very much like a, 
yeah, but you know, you can have one now and then you don't have to have one later. Or if you have two now, then you'll be all right for when you go and do this. Or, oh yeah, but you are feeling a bit stressed and so maybe having that will, will uh, help because then you won't get back pain. Um, even if I didn't have back pain yet, it would be like these reasonings, these little reasonings. And it's like you're talking with yourself, but the, that self is like the devil. It's like going... Um, yeah, go on. It's all right. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's it's trying to make excuses or reasoning for why it's okay to keep taking the drug or whatever. So yeah, that's interesting as well. And um, but it can obviously once you become more and more aware of how bad it is for you and you can't stop, it can suddenly turn shift into this like you need it, you need it, take it, you know, sort of situation. Oh, I'm just so glad to be out of that. <laughs> I'm so glad that that is done. Uh, gosh, yeah, over two months clean now. Um, actually, hang on. Yeah, over two months clean now. But anyway, yeah, I'm going to go take that break and um, be right back. All right, I am back. Let's do this. Okay, the next one was called I Do Not Want This. Well, that sounds like it's going to be quite horrible. <laughs> right, let's read what it says here. Cass has said, the protagonist tries to fight the change and seems to show regret, but it's too late. He's becoming the toxic evil ruiner. He's lost most of his humanity and by the end he seems to want absolute power. That's very much what I was trying to say with the dissociative uh, thing. Um, that dissociative part of you is, like I said, feelings of grandeur and um, wanting power, absolutely wanting power. And a lot of it comes from being powerless maybe in the past and being, you know, a victim of something. wonder if he's got some, like, PTSD. <laughs> but yeah, let, let's hear it. I'm ready. Losing ground well, you Interesting dissonant tonal sounds. Made of clay. This way. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I really relate to this. It's kind of sad that I do, but I do. Now that's aggressive. Wow. <laughs> Ugh. 
so disjointed. Great. That one was like extremely just dark. There was just a darkness within it, just real like venom actually. And reading those lyrics were really interesting too. I feel like the lyrics are getting more and more. I'm understanding them more and more as well as the album goes on. Weirdly, I mean, I, I got them all earlier, but these ones I'm understanding on like some sort of personal level, and not so much now. But when I was in my dissociative state, so here it says. With the interlude bit, the bit that says, I'm always falling down the same hill, bamboo puncturing the skin, and nothing comes beating out of me, just a waterfall I'm drowning in. Two feet below the surface, I could still make out your wavy face. And if I could just reach you, maybe I could leave this place. And interestingly, there's a bit where it's like, but it went, obviously you're not going to know what that is if I just do that noise but there was a little bit and it felt like something trying to come out from under the surface but I could see it as skin like a person underneath skin trying to reach out of the skin and I guess that kind of makes sense with this as well doesn't it um and then the vocal at the end uh, it had like a bit of a gargle to it and that sounded like being underwater which was interesting but I clicked on those little lyrics I just said and it says here He's repeating the same mistakes over and over again and sinking deeper and deeper into the depths, something that would later be touched upon in Reptile. Though he knows what it is that he does wrong and what the results are, his internal conflict leaves him with no options out of it. Yeah, there's no escape. No escape. And I literally said it feels like something trying to escape. It literally felt like that, for sure. At this point, the narrator has become extremely nihilistic. And I was thinking this as well throughout the album. There's a lot of nihilism in it understandably. And because of this, the last line could ve vary heavily depending on how many characters you consider are involved in the downward spiral. It's also very possible that he, the narrator afflicted by the machine, is referring to his own self, who he was before the, he fell below the surface, and that if he could recall who and what he was, he could put himself out. However, this is just one interpretation of an extremely vague line. Wow, well, yeah. So yeah, I'll click on that. I want to know everything. I want to be everywhere. The funny thing about this statement is how in here, see, he remarks that God is dead and no one cares, but here he seems to want godlike powers. <laughs> Omniscience and omnipresence. This line is from the machine's perspective, which would make sense considering the battle against the machine that has continued from the becoming into this song. At this point, they are effectively one and the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, weird. It, it, I just understand it so much. And uh, when you're in that dark, destructive place, you you think you do think of yourself as somewhat godlike. Uh, with powers. I, I know that sounds really bizarre, but it, it does, it can feel like you have powers. And in some ways it's like, you really do. Like you tap into a part of your mind that you don't really use. Um, I found when I was in my dissociative state, I would be extra good at manipulation. And it is, it's quite a wild situation, but I didn't really want to talk about it too deeply, but there were moments where I'd stand in the mirror and look at myself and just have my arms out like this and be like, I feel like power like surging through me. And it, obviously it's all in the mind, but that's what I felt. It was like this, I felt like I was just sucking up all the knowledge in the world. I felt like I was the most intelligent person in the world too. And I could know the psyche of every person. And I was in tune with what they liked for. And like, say if someone started bringing up uh, a conversation about car mechanics, something I actually don't know about, in that dissociative space, it actually felt like, I did know things about car mechanics. It's like I could talk about it and be an expert at it. So there's this like godlike arrogance to it where and confidence where you can just act, like access this part of your brain that isn't usually accessible. I know that sounds really bizarre because it is, it is a little bit bizarre, but it's a condition, you know? Um, it's just crazy to like listen to this. I didn't think I'd actually 
resonate with it. I didn't. Anyway, I'm going to move on to the next song, which is called Big Man with a Big Gun. Has has said, Big Man with a Big Gun. Trigger warning, some lyrics can be interpreted as SA or hurting someone physically. Though I think it's metaphorical slash imagined. The protagonist is delirious, so he's not the most reliable narrator. It's unclear if he actually hurts someone or just imagines it. But either way, he is now irredeemable. Note the presence of more sexual double entendre, again hinting that the Rona is a dominating male figure. Well, I kind of thought that with the, the title, a big man with a big gun. You know, gun could be phallic. Says here, fucking gun also has two interpretations, his weapon and his, or his gun for fucking, aka his genitalia. Yeah, like I was thinking. Trent has said, I had written those lyrics pretty quickly and I didn't know if I was going to use them or not. To me, downward spiral builds to a certain degree of madness, then it changes. That would be the last stage of delirium. So the original point of Big Man with a Big Gun was madness, but it was also making fun of the whole misogynistic gangster rap bullshit. Huh, that's interesting. All right, I'm ready for it. Very disturbing sounds. Got those simps back. <laughs> That's interesting. It's that power taken over completely. Such a difference. Such a different to the song uh, difference when you hear this and then the song Closer. But Closer is this is like self-loathing, this not wanting to have sex with someone because they like feel like they might contaminate them to now being like, yeah, I'm gonna fucking do what I want with you. You know? Such a difference. It's this thing has taken over completely. Wow, that was a really short one, but it, it, it said it's peace. It, there you are. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's mental. All right, let's move to the next one. I want to keep it going. Next one is called A Warm Place. And it says a big man with a big gun was almost like the end of the delusion. So I wonder where we'll go now. Will it be like a kind of shifting out of the delusion? You know, and I have to admit, when you come out of that delusion of thinking you're the fucking toughest, even though it's a dark one and it's a dark place, you start to feel very depressed. You feel very, and depression is definitely the right word. You just feel numb, empty, a little bit like, what has happened? Like, what? Um, yeah, I wonder what this will be about. It might not be nuts. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let's just go for it. Ooh, it's an instrumental, really. Just one line. The best thing about life is knowing you put it together. Huh. Is that the best thing? Could be the worst. Place. Kind of feels sad after all that chaos. A warm place is normally something like 
safe, full of love, healing. Mm. Eraser is next. And that can sound like an erasing sound. Yeah, that's weird. All right, okay. Um, yeah, so A Warm Place. This song is meant to represent last shimmering bits of humanity in a protagonist before he completely gives in to the ruiner. Ooh, that last bit of safety, security, warmth. Yeah, that's fucking, that, that's why it's so sad that humanity is completely gone at this point. It's gone. Shit. Right, this song's got a racer. Cass has said, all of the protagonists, humanity is gone and the ruin has taken over. I feel like the weird background sounds like a person kind of talking or humming are meant to represent the protagonist attempting to break through. At the end, the protagonist begs for death. He doesn't want to live like this and believes that death is the only way to stop the evil ruiner. Fuck. Let's go. Let's do it. Terrifying sounds. Wow. Coming in with the big drums. Almost feels like a reaver. But into the, you know, the ruiner. It's like growing. And it, it's like, it's my time to shine. Yeah. It's a desolate feeling to it though. An emptiness. Completely penetrating and just driving it. The cow me! Cow me! You can feel that. And what I found interesting too is need you, dream you, find you, taste you, fuck you, use you. So it's like he's thinking of someone, and he's like, I need them, I dream of them, and I find them, and I taste them, I fuck them, and I use them up. And then by doing that, you know, because he's not in a good place, he ends up scarring them, breaking them. Uh, you know, he, he's scarring a person, but he's hurting people, basically. Um, and then he's like, feels this like, like, you know, hate for himself. There's lose me, hate me, smash me, erase me. Like, no, I didn't mean to hurt you like this. I, I don't want to hurt you. Just kill me. Kill me. Take me out of this suffering. It kind of feels like that to me. But it could also be like, you know, uh, a drug thing too. Need you, dream you, find you, taste you, fuck you. And then use you, scar you, break you, you know, like using it to like the, uh, the drugs, you know. And then it's like, no. I can't get out of the drug sort of thing as well, you know? Actually, when I click on the use you, sky you, break you, it says, this relates to the previous lines. The protagonist feels his past lover has broken him and he wants to take back control by doing the same thing that he felt she did to him. He wants to use her for himself, scar her like she's done to him and break her in the same way that the entire album is depicting him being broken. And that makes a lot of sense. I, I've said this earlier, heartbreak. 
heartbreak is one of the strongest triggers of like uh dissociating like one of the you know trauma and ptsd or and, and you know like um it's definitely a big trigger but it happens when it happens earlier on in life you can get dissociative through that but like if you would say if you already had that dissociative tendency within you it can be unleashed by heartbreak and when you've been used and hurt and scarred and triggered multiple times by someone that you love um yeah you do end up kind of wanting to do the same and that goes for anyone it's not just a dissociative thing i have your mind like if you've been hurt torn apart all these things it can make you want to do not want to do the same but you don't feel like it's fair that it's happened to you and you almost want to step into the mind of someone that can do that to you to understand them better you want to be like how can you hurt someone like that so then your mind starts you know in its desperate grasp for control, your mind starts to become the thing that you don't understand so you can understand it. You know, like people say, if you haven't gone through it, then you won't understand. But it's like that. It's literally just the same as that. And well, that's my best take on it. And that's something that I understand. But yeah, sad, really sad. All right, next one. We've now got Reptile. It says, Closer 2.0 Sorter. The protagonist views himself as subhuman, and now he seems to view his lover that way as well. He again uses sex to fill a void, but it still doesn't work, and it never will. It never will. Only you can fill that void, unfortunately. And yeah, it takes a lot to fill it, but sex won't do that. Okay, let's do it, Reptile. This is such a cool album though. Heavy? Yeah. Pretty interesting. Sounds like something rolling back and forth. Or it's like doors trying to shut but there's something in the way, so they keep opening. <laughs> it's interesting all the different things they must have recorded to get these interesting sounds. Ooh, it almost sounds like a squealing pig. It does. She spreads herself wide open to let the insects in. I love the melody. Just that droning kind of like chuggy kind of She has the blood of a reptile just underneath the skin. Seeds from a thousand. Some sort of femme fatale. Oh god, he's angry. I love this one. I really like the sound of this one. I have with all of them, but this one has something. Oh yeah, so it does something. Oh, I'm so excited for you all to see this reaction because I've had so much fun with it. <laughs> it sounds silly to say about something so dark, but... <laughs> Oh my god, it's so good. Angels bleed from the deep tip touch of my caress. Damn, that tainted touch. Need to contaminate to alleviate this loneliness. Wow, the lyrics! I love that verse. Wow. 
Almost has a good voice, doesn't it? Drags you down. Vampiric almost. Oh, damn it, let me go. about that one something about that one really had like something i don't know but I, it just fit with me and the sound all every sound fit with me oh i just loved it so much and of course the words are just harrowing and pained and dark and oh just that second verse devil speak of the way in which she'll manifest angel bleed angels bleed from the tainted touch of my caress oh you know, the, the, that's just that line work. Devils speak, angels bleed. Oh, even that, you know, and then the tainted touch of my caress, which goes back to that, you know, contamination thing again. And then he says, need to contaminate to alleviate this loneliness and to contaminate, need to fuck, need to have sex to not feel lonely, to feel the void, to feel the fucking void. I now know the depths depths I reach are limitless. He's gone so far down below, got lost so far that he knows there is there is no end anymore. And I know that too. I know that too from addiction as well. When, when you say this is the hardest thing I've ever gone through, trust me, it can always get harder and it can always get lower. There is no limit to the darkness. But it's same, it means the same thing on the way up as well. You can be happier too. But the start verse sounded like a woman who's like maybe uh had sex with a few quite a lot of people or maybe cheated on him or you know um and he's almost saying she's it, it almost gave me a um heart-shaped box kind of feel by nirvana you know you know um and he goes throw down your umbilical news so i can climb right back and that's about uh you know kirk wayne's talking about courtney loves vaginino <laughs> um and he's saying you know her femme fatalness her sexualness it lures him back in even when he doesn't want to be lured back in um i'll click on this as well though choices of metaphor reinforce the album's motif of warp studio christian imagery the song in particular evokes the book of exodus insects disease blood and reptiles Okay, frogs. Being among plagues visited by God upon Egypt and a land of milk and honey being their Israelite's ultimate destination following the exodus. Oh, God, that's way more to it than I thought. These lines could be a reference to the narrator's love in Closer. Honey is only ever mentioned in Closer and Reptile. So it would be referencing the same source of that pleasure and release the narrator indulged in. It may be only now that he realises how little he means to this lover and how dependent upon sex he has become, fueling the idea that there is no one in the world that actually has any value of him, not the voices in his mind nor the people in his life are supporting him today. Thus, his mind de devolves into a deeper state of depression and unaliving thinking. Alternatively, he could be disgruntled or jaded with his lover based on a derogatory way in which he potentially describes her opening her legs, spreading her disease around. That's what I see. This is what I was thinking. Um, like any man she lets in her body will be uh, tainted with the same fate of self loathing, maybe. However, the metaphor of honey for disease is unlikely. Yeah, but leaves a trail of honey because, like, you know, honey's an attractive thing. Honey attracts ants. Honey attracts bees. Honey attracts, you know, bears. It attracts things. Honey's a sweet taste. It's almost like a false allurement, you know? So that, that's how I think of it. 
um, more likely a re refers to the mindless adoration that she receives from the people whom she's manipulated. Alternatively, the song could refer a drug. Yes, the honey trail is the attraction similar to the mindless adoration of a lover, the bloodstream and under the skin referring to injecting. Yeah, either way, Trent is displaying an addiction to something that he is simultaneously attracted to and repulsed by. Yes, absolutely all of that. <laughs> absolutely. All right, moving on, we've got the downward spiral, the title track and the pinnacle song on the album. Trigger warning for attempted unaliving from 2 minutes 34 to 308. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. Um, really, really uh, do appreciate you doing that though, Cass. Uh, the protagonist attempts to unalive himself. He possibly succeeds. I think this is up to interpretation and Aruna mocks him. The spiral has ended. <sighs> right, I'm ready. Mm, sounds like flies. I love how it drops into a warmer, depthier, fuller sound. Ooh, the detuned strings. Oh. incredibly sad and do you know what it makes me think just that outro bit everything's blue everything's blue in this world obviously that could mean sad but also the deeper shade of mushroom blue all fuzzy it reminds me of you know the little moment before death that where you get a release of dmt and you basically hallucinate and see shit basically <laughs> you know what i mean you go on a trip before you die, being shot in the head, it can happen. And it's like a burst, like a real burst, unless it's immediate, but you, you know what I'm saying? That makes me think of the DMT sort of moment before you die, um, and in a weird way, I don't know why, but it weirdly softens the death just because it's like, it make, it's all becomes whimsical and like unreal almost. Um, but yeah, I'll click it. So in the blue bit, it says, in reference to the notion that the world is simply sadness and melancholy without hope, the line is <laughs> epitome of the existential nihilism present on the album, of course. Uh, then it says, certain species of mushroom have an eerie blue tint to them, all fuzzy. Um, the final moments of your mental and visual state after experiencing a gunshot wound to the head. Um... This, and then there's spinning out of my head. This line is barely audible in the song as the narrator's human side is struggling to break through the noise. The blood slash flesh of the protagonist is spinning out through the wound. It's also interesting how the runa began the song in third person, but refers to the main character's head as his in the end of the song, possibly a hint towards that they're ultimately part of the same being. Well, they are, of course they are. Yeah, I still stand by my DMT moment as well, the way it becoming all strange looking. Yeah, wow, very sad. And, it, and the musical aspect of it was interesting as well, just like sounding like this party going on in, in another room and he could almost imagine him in the dark room and he'd just done this to himself and no one could hear the gunshot because of the party going on. But yeah, it's actually so sad, so sad. 
Okay, and now we've got the last song, and the last song is called Hurt. Um, and I know this song, but uh, I don't know if I've heard the Nine Inch Nails version, funnily enough. I've definitely heard the Johnny Cash one a million times. I might, I might have heard it. I probably have. But yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for it. This is a very sad song to have at the end. But I actually like this being the end song uh, rather than that one that we just heard because that's so sad and dark. Um, I'll quickly read actually what uh, Cassa said about her. Warning, there is a huge jump in volume at 4.32, which always scares me. Oh God, I'll look out for that. The protagonist reflects on what happened and is saying that if he had another chance, he would do things differently. These lyrics also come directly from Trent Reznor's diary. And he has said about the song, a song based on the most personal sentiments, the deepest emotions I've ever had. We were crying when we made it. It was so intense. I didn't know if I even wanted to put it on the album. I didn't know that. That's sad. In the book that came with the album, Trent explains that the album ends with her because it's the thematic bottom of the spiral. But it also guides the listener to a different headspace. The bottom, while often considered negative, doesn't have to be the end, particularly with regards to drug addiction in this case. Instead, it is often the first step to recovery. Yes, it sure is. I'm fucking crying at like, well, I'm not crying, but like I feel like I could. <laughs> Just reading that. Yeah. That's a nice little positive note at the end, to be fair. All right, let's do it. I'm ready to feel sad. <laughs> I hurt myself today. Oh, I didn't know it sounded glitchy and dark like that. Focus on the pain. The only thing that's real. Try to kill it all away. But I remember everything. What have I become? Coming in, Ali. Ready? How detuned it is it's like it's like singing from like a darker place Okay, big volume shift in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I turned it down. <laughs> Save me with that one, Cass. <laughs> the fact that Johnny Cash did a version of this is just actually kind of epic. <laughs> can't even imagine, well, I can imagine Johnny Cash listening to this album. I actually can't, but I <laughs> still find it, like, funny. Wow, it ends on this almost 
very dark and tortured sound. Just nothingness almost. A void. Just fading into the end. Yeah, interesting. Okay, okay. Jesus Christ, I've been filming her for two and a half hours. Obviously I had a little break in between, but it was literally 15 minutes. Um, fuck me, God. Heavier than I thought it would be, you know. I knew it was gonna be heavy. I knew it was gonna have like a mental health thing and it's gonna be dark, but actually I felt that more than I thought I would. I really did. And I loved it too. It was tasteful in the sound, so like the sounds are still, you could listen to them. It's not just like dark and you can't listen to it, you know, it, it, it's dark, but you can listen to it. I don't know, they still have a feeling that you enjoy uh, within the instrumentation. But wow, it's actually really sad though, the ending. Like I don't like that, you know, in the end he succumbed to, you know, he couldn't take it anymore and he gave up. Like that makes me sad. It makes me sad because because there's you can get out of anything in a way. But when it comes to matters of the mind, you you can heal, you can get better. I'm not saying of anything, that's a bit far fetched, but you know, with something like this, he he could have, he could have if he just kept going. It it's horrible to feel like the ruiner won. You know, well well of course it's not nice, is it? And how it's like a metaphoric and relates to Trent, you know, um, and how he felt completely raptured by this thing. But I'm, I'm fucking grateful to hear that it wasn't him. Like it didn't actually happen to him. Like thank goodness for that. Still, just shows like how he felt was very felt very dark. And to talk about mental health on that level in 1994, it's phenomenal actually. Um, no wonder it's so iconic. Yeah, I, I was thinking as well, you know, the song, um, finish with my woman, cause I, oh, what's it going like? I thought you were my friend. Oh yeah, Black Sabbath, Paranoid, yes. So, I was funny, cause I remember Ozzy said something like, this song, obviously it came out way before uh, this, it came out in 1970, but this song, it goes, literally lyrics, Finish with my woman cause she couldn't help me with my mind People think I'm insane because I am frowning all the time Um, He had depression, but in the 70s, he had no, the, the word depression wasn't like a thing Yeah, maybe the Great Depression, but not like depression as a mental health thing wasn't a thing so he called the song paranoid because he's like well i guess i'm paranoid like the, like depression wasn't a thing you know well it was a thing but it wasn't a known you know what i mean and i found that interesting i was like oh my god like imagine that not even knowing obviously we've all had moments where we don't know what we're suffering with or we don't quite know what's happening to us like for me only like in the last couple of years i've realized i probably have adhd but before that i just thought i was like the, i didn't know why i was the way i was you know i was like why i don't know and it and it you know it gets blamed on so many other mental health things that you're like well, I guess it's a bit of this, a bit of that, I don't know. But, um, you know, now I've come to find like, nah, it's ADHD, definitely. <laughs> definitely, there's no denying it. But yeah, so we've all can struggle and find new things out about ourselves. But things like depression in the 70s, yeah, he called it par paranoid because he's like, what's depression? And that's why I feel like with the Nine Inch Nails, I know, I know it's like 24 years later, but still in the 90s, it still wasn't like a big thing to talk about anxiety, depression, like no. So him talking about it through this concept -y album, it was actually a really good release for him, I imagine. Wow, anyway, I really enjoyed that. And thank you so much for the request, Cast in the Grass. And thank you everyone else who's watching. And I really do hope you enjoyed uh, as much as I enjoyed listening. Um, and yeah, I shall see you next time. Bye.